informed consent, principles, and practice. Hello and welcome to this educational video on informed consent. My name is Dr. Dan Macy's. I'm the director of the University of California San Diego's Human Research Protections Program, and I'll be your host for this exploration into a very important topic for all researchers. In this video, you'll be introduced to several aspects of informed consent, including the purpose of informed consent, the processes involved when developing and administering informed consent, as well as the historical roots of informed consent within the larger context of research ethics. To help guide you through this training, we've gathered a group of professionals in this field to share their knowledge, experience, and personal insights about informed consent. I've seen so many consents where I don't even understand the document, and I'm working with the guy who wrote the consent. You'll hear from Dr. Joel Dimsdale, who's a research scientist and a former member of institutional review boards. I do research on patients with schizophrenia, specifically looking at their decision-making capacity and trying to find ways to improve the informed consent process. Dr. Laura Dunn is a faculty member in psychiatry, specializing in research involving informed consent and decision-making capacity assessment. Informed consent is really the cornerstone of research. Lucille Pearson is the Deputy Director of the UCSD Human Research Protections Program. The purpose of informed consent is really to enlist the patient, in the case of treatment, and the subject as a partner in whatever you're trying to pursue. And Dr. Larry Snyderman is a nationally recognized ethicist specializing in issues of medical ethics, including informed consent. It's absolutely essential that patients know what's going on, and so that's the purpose of informed consent. Although ethical questions have surely existed in all cultures throughout history, the most widely recognized need for informed consent in modern times dates back to the late 1940s, when Nazi physicians were accused and tried for cruel research they had performed on prisoners of war. The result of this trial was the Nuremberg Code, the first internationally recognized code of research ethics. The Nuremberg Code begins with these words. The voluntary consent of the human subject is absolutely essential. This means that the person involved should have legal capacity to give consent, should be so situated as to be able to exercise free power of choice without the intervention of any element of force, fraud, deceit, duress, overreaching, or other ulterior form of constraint or coercion, and should have sufficient knowledge and comprehension of the elements of the subject matter involved as to enable him to make an understanding and enlightened decision. We generally think that it was after World War II with the Nuremberg Code in 1948 was the beginning of the whole idea of informed consent in uh, research. Actually, it was earlier than that. In 1900, the Prussian government issued regulations for medical interventions that were not therapeutically beneficial to the patient and said very specifically that no such interventions could be done without the absolute permission of the person receiving the intervention. Why this is interesting is because almost half a century before the rest of the world caught up with the idea that we should have informed consent for clinical research, the Prussian government uh, was way ahead of the rest of the world. Now, what we should realize is that prior to World War II, Germany, of all places, was the place where science was considered the best in the world. American scientists went to Germany to learn science. German intellectuals were very conscious about the role of science in the world. More than half of Nobel Prize winners up to that time were German-speaking. Now, why this is important to think about today is how fragile this kind of preeminence was. 
within a few decades after that great stand in medical ethics, as we all know, the Nazis took over and we had the horrible events of human research without consent on involuntary slaves and subjects. And it shows to me how vulnerable this whole idea of patients' rights and informed consent is. In other words, it's not enough to have laws and rules and regulations. You have to have a culture. You have to have a society. You have to have people who are responsible, who care about this, who will continue to keep these rights and rules and regulations going. It didn't happen in Germany, obviously, and we have to be very cautious that what we have in this country and the rest of the world continues the way we are going today. In the case of the experiments uh, in Nazi Germany, the patients were not volunteers in any way. They were prisoners, they were forced to do something, and they were not informed either about the nature of the studies. Some of the studies were frankly sadistic. Others were troubling in that they had in mind a worthwhile medical goal, but the way they went about it was antithetical to any reasonable person's definition of human subjects design. What do I mean by that? There were famous studies of exposure, uh, uh, concerns about how long a downed fighter pilot would survive in the North Atlantic under hypothermia. Well, they immersed uh, concentration camp inmates uh, in ice water mixes and did the studies. They tracked, essentially, the survival time and what organ systems failed after how long of an exposure. This was a forced imposition, a forced terminal experiment, and there was no way that the patient had the right to volunteer, nor was he even appraised of what he was being exposed to. The phenomenon that came from the Nuremberg trials, besides the horror of finding out what had been done to individuals in the name of science, was the understanding that in order to conduct ethical research, informed consent was absolutely necessary, because nobody should ever participate in research who isn't doing it voluntarily. purpose of informed consent. The overall purpose of informed consent is to provide research participants with clear information on the purpose, procedures, requirements, and potential risks associated with their participation in a research study. Informed consent consists of two components that must be present and one that must be absent. The first, of course, is providing information to potential study participants that will help them make the decision whether or not to participate. This information has to be communicated in language that is understandable by the participant. Second, the researcher has to determine that the person has the capacity to understand and use this information to make a meaningful choice. The thing that must be absent is any element of coercion or undue influence that would cause a study participant to make a decision that was not in their best interest. Participants in studies have to know what they're getting into. They have to have full knowledge. They have to know as much as the investigator knows. Overall, the purpose of informed consent is to protect the participants' autonomy, their ability to govern themselves in decision making so that they can make a voluntary, uncoerced, fully informed decision about whether to participate in a research study. Informed consent is the knowing agreement of an individual or his or her legally authorized representative that is obtained voluntarily and without force, coercion, or undue influence. During the informed consent process, a potential subject should receive enough information about a study to make a meaningful decision about whether or not they want to participate. 
Not only do researchers and their staff have to supply this information, but they must also ensure that each research subject understands it and is making an informed and voluntary decision to participate. The Institutional Review Board, or IRB. The purpose of the IRB is the protection of human subjects. If an IRB does their job really well, they not only protect human subjects, but they protect the investigator and the institution. An IRB is a group of disinterested uh, persons who review grant proposals, research proposals, to look upon whether or not the proposal asks a worthy question, addresses uh, a question that is worth subjecting patients at risk to, and how great the risks are, whether those risks ought to be accepted as being worth the expected outcome. So these are people who will take somebody's proposal and without any involvement or conflict of interest be able to say, this is a good idea and the way you've informed the subjects and the kinds of uh, care you've taken to avoid or compensate for risks is worthy and we will approve of it. And this is a obligation for all federally funded uh, uh, trials. The system of local institutional review boards, commonly called IRBs, was set up by the U.S. federal government in the 1970s to review federally funded research. These review boards were created to ensure that human subjects are not placed at undue risk through research studies and to ensure that research participants have been properly advised of possible risks associated with their being in a study before they make the decision to participate. Nearly 4,000 IRBs are authorized by the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services to perform this task. Who are these people? The answer to that is that they're everybody. Uh, the IRB is comprised of people from a variety of medical specialties, frequently nurses, social workers, some community representatives, frequently lawyers, frequently ethicists, but primarily physicians. They know medicine, they know illness, they know the art of treatment, they know the problems of current treatments, and they can appreciate what the goals are in doing research. But they also are very attuned to what can go wrong in human subjects investigations. I've been on two IRBs in two different universities. They've been amazing experiences. It's hard to uh, distill that down other than to say you usually have a room of 12 to 20 people all trying earnestly to do the right thing and knowing full well that they have to say no a lot of the time. Not necessarily a definitive not now never no but it's not ready for prime time yet. You need to go back, you need to tweak this. The IRB members review huge numbers of protocols from every medical specialty and thus they know um, uh, basic research design and they know the sorts of things that can go wrong uh, in, in human subjects studies and they know the sorts of things that should be in a consent. You will no doubt have to have many letters back and forth between you and your IRB. The best advice I can give you is that remember that these people are not doing it to thwart your career they're not pursuing a vendetta against you. Matter of fact, probably the guy two doors down from your lab is sitting on the IRB and you probably have lunch with him half the time. These are people who know what's going on in hospitals and clinics and people who are trying to assure that we all do the right thing. 
An IRB is composed of individuals who have the expertise and background needed to conduct a thorough review of the research planned by the institution. Federal regulations require an IRB to have at least five members with varying backgrounds and expertise, including at least one non-affiliated community member. The society at large, lay people at large, have to be involved in a decision that says, this ain't worth studying, or whatever you say, doc, this is too risky. I just don't think I would want my mother or my children to be subjected to this kind of study. Therefore, I don't think it matters what you think. It's what we in society think according to our values. And that has to be taken into account. So a good IRB, just like a good ethics committee, should be able to say, we not only have scientists who say this is reasonable, and community, lay people who look upon it and say, we agree, this is reasonable. I like to think of the lay people as being a kind of Greek chorus. In the plays, the old Greek plays, there was a Greek chorus behind the action that would comment and say, this is what we think is going on. Oh, isn't it terrible? Or I hope this will happen. In a sense, society has always had to have access to the community values. If we get away from that, then we do risk losing the trust of the people that we're supposed to be helping. When starting a new project, it's important to keep in mind that all proposed research protocols and consent forms must be reviewed and approved by the local IRB before the research can begin. Additionally, federal policy requires that any revision to a previously approved research plan or consent must be reviewed and reapproved prior to making the change. Once a protocol is approved by the IRB, at the time of initial approval, the investigator is told by the IRB how long that approval lasts. If it doesn't say that it is limited to, for example, the first patient, the first two patients, and then report back to the IRB, the regulations will allow an IRB to give approval for one calendar year, 365 days. We are not allowed as an IRB to give approval past 365 days. During that year that a pro protocol is approved, approval can be rescinded by an IRB. If an IRB sees trends in a study based on, for example, adverse event reports, that we receive, then the IRB can say, stop. We need to have you reassess, and it's based on risk. IRB members are struggling. They're grappling. They're, they're, they're sharing a perspective. And as they put their work together, they have a very good perspective on the nature of, uh, of a clinical trial and a clinical study. IRBs are run with integrity. These are people who are trying to do the right thing. And IRBs try very earnestly to make sure that we investigators are approaching our tasks with integrity as well. How to prepare a consent form. If you're a new investigator and you've never written an informed consent, the first thing you should do is you should check what your institution has available for you. Uh, sometimes that'll save you hours of work. If you are at a small institution where there aren't a lot of aids available to you, then the next best thing to do is to go on to the OHRP, that's the Office for Human Research Protections website, and pull up their uh, guidance on informed consent. A consent form is actually a very simple document. It's supposed to explain to the patient what the study is about, what the risks are of being in the study, what the possible benefits are of being in the study, and the fact that the patient doesn't have to be in the study, that he can drop out at any time. When preparing a consent form, it is important to keep in mind that there are a number of elements that must be included in the document before it will be approved by the IRB. 
Some of the specific elements that must be included are listed in the Code of Federal Regulations, but your local institution may require additional items to be present. To simplify the process, there is a basic structure that should be followed when preparing the document. Start the document by including the following sections. Introduction, procedures, possible risks and benefits, alternatives to participation, cost, compensation for injury, right to withdraw, questions, and signature. I'll walk you through these essential elements that must be included in a consent form. Introduction. As with most documents, you should begin your consent form with an introduction. The introductory section should include a statement that the subject is being asked to participate in a research study. Participants in clinical research often fail to appreciate the distinctions between clinical care and clinical research. So it's very important that researchers take active steps to dispel any such therapeutic misconception. Part of informed consent is using the right language. And in fact, it has been shown that just simply saying, this is a drug, this is a medicine, uh, makes people think, oh, if it's a drug or a medicine, it must be to help me. Whereas this is a substance that we are testing, this is a chemical that we are testing, much more neutral words will make the patient ask, well, what do you mean by a chemical, rather than if it's a medicine, well, clearly I don't have to ask any questions. It is important to provide the name and degree of the principal investigator for the study and indicate the department and institution that is conducting the study. If the investigator is a student, include the name of the person supervising the research. The introduction should also include an explanation of the purpose for the project using language that is clear and understandable in layman's terms. The total number of subjects being recruited for the study should also be included. Procedures. This is one of the most important sections of the consent form. The procedures section should clearly outline what the subject will be asked to do or undergo if he or she chooses to participate. After reading this section, the subject should know how frequently and in what ways they will be expected to participate in the study. The procedures section should include a description of the time points of the study, describing what will happen step by step. This section should clearly state when the study visits will occur and how long each one will last. When you talk about procedures in an informed consent document, it's very important that you be simple and clear. First of all, you'll make a statement in the consent to the effect, if you decide to participate in the study, the following will happen to you. And at that point, you lay out clearly one, two, three, four, what the procedures are. And the procedures can be everything from drugs being administered, MRIs, x-rays, uh, histories, physicals, anything that's part of your research plan of your protocol. Possible risks and benefits. In the risks and benefits section of the consent form, you should describe any reasonably foreseeable risks or discomforts to the subject in clear detail. In this section, you would also highlight any possible benefits to the subject. In many cases, it may be that the only likely benefit is in helping society at large through the new knowledge that may result from your study. Alternatives to research participation. A list of alternative procedures or possible treatments, if any, that might be beneficial to the subject should also be included in the consent form. Cost. It's important that you make sure participants are aware of any expenses they may incur as a result of being a research subject. A few years ago, there were several uh, protocols that came across um, my desk that went to the IRB that involved new uh, pacemakers. And in order for the IRB to uh, approve the consent, we had to make sure that the a PI informed the uh, potential participant in the consent that the uh, what the costs would be of 
the uh, investigational uh, pacemaker and that because it was investigational that probably their insurance company wouldn't pay for it. Again, that's cost and that's a fiscal risk and it has to be disclosed. Additionally, compensation for participating in the study should also be clearly defined in this section. If participants receive partial compensation at different time points during the study, they should be informed of the payment timeline in this section of your consent form. Compensation for injury. Every consent form should have a section that outlines your institution's policy on compensation for injury. Local IRBs typically have standard language for this section of the consent that should be copied verbatim into your document. Please check with your local IRB office for their policy. The compensation for injury section should also indicate whom to contact in the event of a study-related injury. You should also include contact information for your local IRB office. The federal regulators, uh, surprisingly enough, do not have a regulation that says that an institution or a researcher has to pay for injury. What the regulation is that you just have to tell them if you do or if you don't. Right to withdraw. It is important to let the research participant know that their involvement in the study is entirely voluntary and that there will be no penalty or loss of benefits as a result of either not participating or withdrawing from the research project without completing it. Sometimes patients get into the study halfway and they decide they just don't like it. They have that right to stop. We don't own them in chattel slavery for the duration of the study. They have the right to stop whenever they choose. Questions? Along with providing ample time for the participant to ask questions prior to signing the consent form, the document should also include the name and phone number of whom they may contact if they have any questions regarding the consent or any other aspect of the study. Signature. With some specific exceptions for verbal consent, federal regulations require that the informed consent document be signed and dated by the participant. Additionally, each institution and sponsor may have other requirements for the signature section, including a signature line for a witness or the principal investigator to sign. The most important thing is to make sure your informed consent document is easily understandable. Consent forms should generally be written at the 6th to 8th grade reading level, avoiding technical language wherever possible. Even though most institutional review boards or IRBs actually require consent forms to be written at a basic reading level, for example, 6th to 8th grade reading level, uh, in fact, most consent forms are written at a much higher reading level, 10th, 12th grade, or even higher. So when people are writing their consent forms to pay attention to the language that they use, to run it through um, a language level checker. You can do that on a word processing program. But also to run it, read it out loud, for example. See, see how the language sounds when you read it out loud. Make sure the sentences aren't too long. Make sure it's understandable to a lay person. It, and again, that gets to the spirit of informed consent that is meant to inform and involve the participant in the process and not in any way to exclude them from the process and not to make it feel like it's just a legalistic or cursory um, procedure. Additionally, the consent document should be written in the second person using the pronoun you. For example, the document might say, you will be asked to complete three hours of testing. The document should be typed in a legible font size of at least 11 or 12 points and should provide section headings with double spacing between paragraphs. The most important thing when you write a consent is to put it clearly and to edit it mercilessly. Ask somebody else to read it. Don't ask your closest collaborator to read it. Ask a friend, ask a neighbor. How to administer an informed consent. One of the most important points to remember about administering informed consent is that obtaining consent from participants is not just a matter of getting a signature on a piece of paper. 
Obtaining informed consent is a process of genuine communication between professionals and participants in which information is exchanged, questions are asked and answered, and subjects are allowed to make free choices without manipulation or pressure of any kind. A really good informed consent process requires patience, that's with a CE, and repetition. You know, if, um, if any of you have had a medical procedure done, it's very difficult to remember things. If you have stitches, uh, whether you can take a shower or can't take a shower, over how many days, the doctor has to repeat that a number of times. It's also very helpful uh, in clinical practice, if the doctor gives the patient a handout. We have to do the same sorts of education in research as well. We have to take the time with the patient to make sure he or she really understands what's this study about? What are they going to do to me? Why are they doing it? What are likely things that can go wrong? And what are some of the benefits? Hi, Bernard. Hello. Thanks for coming. You're welcome. Let's get started on the informed consent process. And the way we do the informed consent process here is I'm going to give you a copy of the consent form. And what I'll do is I'll read the, con the consent out loud. And you just follow along with me. OK. If you have any questions during the process, please stop me and ask at any time. Also, if you feel as though I'm going too fast or you want to clarify anything, please feel free to stop Okay. Anytime, thanks. OK? When I administer an informed consent, the first thing that I do is I make sure that we have a location that is quiet and private and free of distractions for the potential participant and I to go back to. I bring two copies of the consent form with me. One is for the participant and one is for myself. I give them the copy of the consent and I let them know that I'm actually going to be reading it out loud to them and they can read along with me and listen as I go through the document. Based on experience of other people who have taken Zyprexa, you may experience drowsiness, headache, weight gain, agitation, dry mouth, or anxiety. The research staff should I give a copy of the consent form to the subject before reading the information out loud so that the subject can listen and read along at the same time. Before reading the information, the subject should be told that he or she can interrupt to ask questions at any time. Also, there should be ample time afterwards to allow the subject to ask further questions. The person giving the consent should be knowledgeable about the study and be able to present and explain information using easily understood terminology. Presenting information in a disorganized and rapid fashion, allowing too little time for consideration, or curtailing opportunities for questions, all may adversely affect a subject's ability to make an informed choice. The research staff will spend about four hours with you performing a physical exam, getting your history of psychiatric difficulties, your medical history, a list of past and current medications, and any history of alcohol, tobacco, and drug use. In this instance, it's important to remember to speak slowly and clearly so that the subject can understand everything that you're saying. Keep in mind, this is a lot of new information for them, and if you read it too fast, they won't be able to understand any of it. If you're interested, you'll be given specific information regarding each of these studies, including procedures and any risks or discomforts that may occur. I have a question. Are, actually, do you mind just holding your question until the end of the section? In this situation, what she should have done was answer the subject's question right away. A lot of this information is new and could be confusing to the subject, so you must answer the questions at any time. Participation in research is entirely voluntary. You may refuse to take part or withdraw. Oh, do you mind if I grab this call really quickly? I'm expecting a call. Hello? Oh, hi! How are you? Giving an informed consent is a very important process. You must always remember to respect the patient by maintaining a professional and quiet environment by minimizing distractions and interruptions as much as possible. The principal investigator is responsible for making certain that steps are being taken to enhance potential participants' understanding of the consent form and to assist their ability to make an informed choice. And once we've gotten to the end of it, I again ask them if they have any questions and if they are interested in participating in the study. 
If they still have questions or concerned or are confused about certain things in the consent form, I try my best to clarify all of their questions and all their concerns. And um, if they decide they don't want to sign the consent form at that time and let them know that that's fine, they can get back to me at any time if they decide later on they want to participate. So Bernard, do you have any questions about the research study? I don't have any more questions. Okay. Are you interested in participating in the project? Yes, sounds very interesting. Okay, so what we can do now is actually just have you sign the consent form and then we can go ahead and make appointments for you to come in at a future date. All right. Okay. If they do want to sign the consent form right then, I have them sign the consent and then I co-sign it documenting that the informed consent process was complete. Assessment of decision-making capacity. Participants who sign a consent form must have adequate decision-making capacity to make a meaningful decision. Now, the first thing that's important about decision-making capacity is it's different from legal competence. A patient can be legally incompetent, can be brought in from the nursing home, uh, not know who the President of the United States is, not uh, and be able to handle his or her bank account and still have decision-making capacity if the patient understands the nature of the illness and its prognosis, understands the treatments that are being offered, the risks and the benefits, can reason it through and can express a choice. And unfortunately, I have come across um, patients who were also in research studies who couldn't really tell me very much in detail about the kind of study they were in. Um, I've heard of instances where people haven't even known they were in a research study, and the literature actually bears that out, that there sometimes are people who don't even know that they're in a research study, who don't understand they can withdraw at any time from a research study, who don't understand important risks and benefits. Decision-making capacity is generally believed to include the following four elements understanding, appreciation, reasoning, and expressing a choice. I think a lot of the time when patients don't get it, it's because we didn't explain it right. So if we have that sense that the patient doesn't truly understand the study, we need to go back and try to explain it again with more clarity. There are the other instances, however, where a patient might not understand as well as you would like them to. These are very troubling problems when a person has limited intelligence, when patients are actively psychotic, when patients are so desperate for treatment that they're not listening and will sign for anything. All of these are settings where you have to ask yourself, is the patient's decision-making capability adequate? Understanding. Understanding is the ability to comprehend information about the nature and purpose of the study, the procedures involved, and the risks and benefits of participating versus not participating. Appreciation. Appreciation is the ability to apply the information, such as potential risks and benefits, to one's own condition and situation. For example, a person may understand that a blood pressure study involves a chance that they may receive a placebo instead of an active medication. But if they don't understand what that means for their own health and well-being, they may not be equipped to adequately judge whether the study is right for them. Reasoning. Reasoning is the ability to weigh options logically and balance the risks and benefits such as the risks and benefits of joining the study. Expressing a choice. Expressing a choice is the ability to communicate appropriately whether or not they want to participate in the research study. There are occasions where it may appear that a participant has adequate capacity when they first enroll, but later on it may become apparent that he or she doesn't fully understand the purpose or nature of the study. Some may not even appreciate the fact that they are in a research study as opposed to receiving normal clinical care. Also, a participant's mental status may change such that one who had capacity on study entry may lose that capacity later in the study. In such instances, the investigator may need to reevaluate their capacity and subsequently may need to consider withdrawing the subject 
or getting surrogate consent from a legally authorized representative. One of the many problems in clinical research uh, and also, of course, in medical treatment is the patient or the subject is so seriously ill and the treatments we're trying to help that person with are so important that we need consent to move on, either to treat the patient or to test the intervention. How can we do this without the patient's informed consent? Now, it's interesting that the Nuremberg Code in 1948 made no exception for surrogate consent. They said the consent of the participant is absolutely essential. And it's only since then we realize that that is too limiting if we really want to help these people. And so we do make exceptions for a legally authorized surrogate to make decisions for the patient in the case of a critical illness or for the subject in the case where the patient lacks decision-making capacity, it's serious enough and the treatment is promising enough so that it's worth the risk. Currently, there's a lot of research going on into, for example, dementia, and in, in many cases, for example, in moderate to advanced cases of dementia, the patient, him or herself, really cannot provide adequate um, informed consent in the sense that we've talked about. They, they don't have adequate decision-making capacity. However, in that case, a surrogate or proxy decision maker can be called on to um, understand the research protocol, go through the consent process. The patient himself should be there as well. They, we should try to make sure they understand as much as possible about the research. The surrogate or proxy needs to provide adequate, adequately informed, voluntary informed consent with the best interest of the actual patient in mind. The patient, though, needs to assent to the, to the study. And that means um, not show by some words or actions that this is something they do not want to do. And a patient may do that by um, becoming agitated when the research staff approaches, something like that, or pulling away from tests or assessments or um, procedures that are being done. And in that case, absolutely the patient's lack of assent needs to be respected. So we can't continue to keep someone in a study. Even if a surrogate or proxy decision, make, decision maker has consented to have that person in the study, if in any way the, the patient seems to be showing that it's not something they want to do. Investigators should view their local IRB as a resource for questions about how to manage these situations in a manner that is appropriate for their specific protocol and patient population. When is decision-making capacity assessment necessary? Guidelines for the formal assessment of decisional capacity are still evolving. However, it is clear that at a minimum, research participants should be assessed for decision-making capacity when the study involves more than minimal risk, and there is reason to expect that at least a portion of the targeted population will have impaired decisional capacity. Let us consider both of these elements in turn. Minimal risk is defined in the Code of Federal Regulations as when the probability and magnitude of harm or discomfort anticipated in the research are not greater in and of themselves than those ordinarily encountered in daily life or during the performance of routine physical or psychological examinations or tests. Minimal risk includes the kinds of risks that people might go through in their ordinary lives, such as getting up in the morning and going to work, going to visit a doctor who draws blood and listens to our chest, for example, if the participant is expected to take an experimental medication as part of a study or a standard medication at a dose that is greater than the FDA-approved level, the research would involve greater than minimal risk. Research participants should also be assessed for decision-making capacity in any study where a significant proportion of the subjects can reasonably be expected to have diminished decision-making capacity. This diminished capacity may be due to impaired cognitive abilities, as in studies that involve participants with dementia or other neuropsychiatric conditions. The researcher should assess decision-making capacity in some way um, for any study that's going to enroll subjects who have 
a mental disorder that might impair decision-making capacity, where there's some reasonable um, idea or consensus in the research community that some proportion of this population uh, may lack decision-making capacity. In those cases, it's reasonable to use a screening instrument to assess capacity prior to enrolling subjects in the study. In some cases, even patients with no impairment of cognitive ability may have diminished capacity. For example, in cases of life-threatening illness, patients may feel desperate for an experimental treatment. And in some types of emergency and trauma studies, a participant may be unable to make a decision. In such cases, research participants should be assessed for decisional capacity. The specific procedures will have to be negotiated with your IRB. Some researchers implement a two-step process to assure proper decision-making capacity. The first step of the two-step process may involve a quick screening method to determine whether there is a need for a more detailed assessment. For example, after reviewing the consent form, a participant may be asked, can you tell me what this study is about? An adequate answer to this question might eliminate the need for further testing of their decisional capacity. However, if there are still questions about the subject's decisional capacity, step two might involve tests, such as a post-consent questionnaire or a standardized cognitive test such as the MacArthur Competence Assessment Tool. Researchers may also develop other methods in consultation with their local IRB. When we talk about assessing decision-making capacity, there really is at this time no gold standard for assessing decision-making capacity. So what we want to talk about is finding ways to assess capacity assess those four areas that we talked about, understanding, appreciation, reasoning, and expression of a choice in the context of each individual study. There are instruments available for doing this. For example, there's an instrument that's the most widely studied and the most well-validated instrument. Uh, that is called the MacArthur Competence Assessment Tool for Clinical Research by Applebaum and Griso, and it can be adopted or modified for each individual study, and it it asks specific questions for each individual study. You modify it for your study, getting at each of those ability areas that we talked about. So for understanding, it would ask questions such as, um, please name two risks of participating in the study, or please describe the purpose of the study. For appreciation, it has several questions that are more open-ended questions to probe whether people appreciate how participation in the study would affect their own situation. For reasoning, the MacArthur Competence Assessment Tool for Clinical Research gets at their ability to generate consequences of their decision to participate or not to participate and to reason and weigh those risks and benefits. And it also asks the person to express a choice and checks again to see if that choice is stable over time. There are other ways to assess decision-making capacity, and these could be as simple as asking questions during the consent procedure or immediately after the consent to assess understanding of the critical information. Also, you want to make sure that the person who's participating or thinking about participating in the research appreciates that the, their participation would be different from receiving usual clinical care if, if in fact, that's the case for that particular study. Sometimes that's not as applicable, but that's a key thing. When people don't understand that difference between clinical care and research, there's actually a term for that. It's called the therapeutic misconception. That means that people have a misconception that the research is intended for their own personal benefit as opposed to being, say, governed by um, treatment algorithms they may not understand that there's randomization involved, and that they may be randomized to a control condition or a placebo condition. So that's something I think is very important to check for when we're assessing capacity. The therapeutic misconception is another reason why informed consent is so essential. It's important that the subject receiving the trial of an intervention understand that it is just that, a trial and not a therapy and so that person understands where he or she is in the therapeutic uh, history of any particular uh, intervention. New developments. 
Some new developments in informed consent are currently being studied at the University of California, San Diego. One project is using multimedia to enhance the informed consent process, supplementing the written informed consent with PowerPoint, DVD, and video presentations to help make the information more easily accessible and understandable to research participants. Here at UCSD, um, a group of researchers, including myself, have been looking at ways to try and upgrade the consent process. So we started out using a very simple technique, namely PowerPoint slideshow, to graphically convey the same information that was in the written consent form, to um, show the information as you might see a lecture sitting in a lecture hall using PowerPoint, using bullets, bullet points, using showing the information sequ sequentially and having review slides. We've gone further with this idea of graphically enhancing the informed consent process by using multimedia, computer-based consent procedures, um, using video, using DVD, and uh, including having a host present consent information. You will complete five to six hours of interviews and tests. We spread these out over two to three days. You will be asked questions about how you are doing. Have you been feeling worried or nervous in the past week? I wouldn't say exactly worried or nervous. You will take part in tests of memory and attention. That's correct. That's and you will do everyday tasks like balancing your checkbook and grocery shopping. For example, the consent form may talk about participants will have an MRI as part of the study. And we would actually show a clip of somebody going into an MRI machine, show what that looks like because many people don't know what an MRI is and it may be intimidating. Your head will be placed in a special helmet-like head holder to keep your head still. We will ask you to lie very still for about five to six minutes while the MRI machine takes the pictures. But you will also be doing certain tasks like learning pairs of words. We will make you as comfortable as we can by patting your neck, shoulders, head, and knees. You will have a mirror that will allow you to see out towards your feet. And there's a microphone inside the magnet so that we can always hear you if you need anything. The whole process takes about an hour. We hope this video has helped you understand the principles and practice of informed consent and has helped you to appreciate that ethics and good science go hand in hand. On our website, you'll find more in-depth resources to help you in all phases of informed consent, as well as other research ethics topics, including patient recruitment, therapeutic misconception, and protecting privacy and confidentiality. Every one of us could be a volunteer in a clinical trial, and if we were a volunteer, we would expect to be informed and to have a choice. If our mother, father, sister, brother, son, daughter, wife was in a clinical trial, we would want that individual to have made an informed choice. And we would feel very angry if the patient participated in a trial and was exposed to something that he didn't volunteer for and that he had no way of knowing about from the consent procedure.